So let's talk about the who, what, when, where. Uh, the who is pretty straightforward. The who is um, a couple of uh, gentlemen, the uh, the uh, chair of the revision task force. Uh, task force for DSM-5 TR is a guy named Michael B. First. I love the name. Michael B. First. It's kind of like Will I Am. Huh? Michael B. First. Um, Michael B. First, if you guys are familiar with psychiatry and have followed DSM stuff, he was a protege of uh, Al Francis. Al Francis, of course, was the task force chair for the DSM-4 and 4 TR. Uh, Michael B. First is an interesting guy. He actually got his master's degree in computer science engineering, so you can tell he's kind of a stats, engineering, epidemiological kind of guy. Uh, he got his medical degree, though, at University of Pittsburgh. He's been with the DSM for a long, long, long time. So he's an inside baseball guy for sure. He's part and parcel of the culture, of the DSM, uh, as you might expect. But he's joined by um, co-chairs Wilson Compton and Daniel Pine. They serve as vice chairs. And they were joined by over 200 subject matter experts. Now, I just want to say a word because there's been a lot of discussion about how the DSM-5 TR has dilated the field, it's broadened the circle, it's widened the circle to let more voices in uh, to the chorus, if you will, more people speaking and contributing to the revision of the DSM than ever before. And so what I did is take the liberty to just literally graph that, okay? So on the left, you see uh, the, psych the percentage of psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health professionals, principally, but not entirely social workers, uh, for the DSM-5 in uh, 2013. And you can see that about 62, 63% um, of the people working on that document back in 2013 were psychiatrists, 30% were psychologists, and about 8% were other social work, marriage and family, um, licensed mental health counselors, LPCs, and so forth. Okay, so fast forward over to the right side, you'll see the Instagram, the bar chart, and you'll see the change in the DSM-5. Well, instead of 63% being psychiatrists, about 60% are psychiatrists. Uh, instead of 30% being psychologists, about 25% are psychologists. And then the, it's a hydraulic model, obviously. So uh, there's a corresponding increase in the number of other mental health professionals. Again, principally social work, but also marriage and family, uh, licensed mental health counselors, and so forth. So when you hear that they've, um, you know, they've enlarged the tent, they've dilated the field, they've brought love, widened the circle, it's up to you to see whether or not you think this is a glass half full or a glass half empty. Does that represent a sea change in inclusiveness of other professions, or does that remain, does that represent an incremental movement toward greater inclusiveness? My tendency is to see it more as the latter, but it is undeniable. It's moved in the direction of including a broader set of voices but don't forget, it's a proprietary document. It's proprietary by the American Psychiatric Association. So it's completely appropriate that they would have predominant representation in relation to making the changes. So what about the outcome of those changes? What are the big changes in the DSM-5-TR? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that they've introduced some new disorders, prolonged grief disorder, we'll talk about in some detail. They've also introduced things like the mild, or like, I'm sorry, the stimulant-induced mild neurocog disorder. Um, there were other mild neurocog disorders, but stimulus-induced was just a greater specification in this case. There are some resurrected disorders. We'll talk about those. Um, and uh, that were once in the DSM, then were removed from the DSM-5 and are back again. Uh, they're back, and that's unspecified mood disorder. So we'll talk about that. There are some conceptually revised disorders. Um, and then there's some new codes, and I've already alluded to suicide and non-suicidal self-injury. Of course, all the ICD-9 codes are gone from the DSM-5-TR. They were in the DSM-5, obviously. They're gone from the 5-TR. We have only ICD-10 codes in the DSM-5. And I've already alluded to the revision in the criteria sets, and we'll talk about a set of about 10 of, 10 of those. And then we'll definitely talk about the uh, what I call the culturally informed extreme makeover uh, in the DSM-5-TR. So let's talk then about the when. Um, well, quite literally, functionally, the DSM-5 PR began immediately after the DSM-5 went to print. Why? Because you may remember, it's been a few years now, but you remember, may remember in 2013, 2014, 2015, as soon as the DSM-5 printed, there, was all, there were all kinds of errata sheets that came out, changes, corrections, revisions, clarifications. They were like whole... Oh, 
you know, portfolios of uh, papers that people were keeping either electronically or physically, uh, just that represented the errata sheets. So all of those changes, everything that represented a correction that followed the DSM-5 publication, everything that represented a correction, revision, clarification, uh, whatever of the DSM-5, all of that carries forward to the DSM-5 TR. So you don't have to go back to those notebooks, to those folders in any way, shape, or form anymore. All of that's been integrated. So quite literally, the moment the DSM-5 published is when literally the DSM-5 TR took over. But officially, the task force wasn't appointed until 2019. And they worked, of course, they worked pro bono. They worked pretty uh, studiously um, yeah, for about three years uh, before the launch in 2022. And it was March of 2022 when the DSM-5 TR uh, literally uh, launched officially. Of course, it concentrates primarily on the last 10 years of advances in the literature. And it does that deliberately and mindfully because it was 10 years ago that the DSM-5 launched. So they're trying to catch up on everything that's happened between the publication of 5 and the publication of 5 TR. So you'll see the heavy emphasis on literature over the last decade, the most recent decade, that's what got, has gotten infused into the DSM-5 TR, uh, very understandably. Okay, so why now? Uh, why do this now? Well, a uh, couple good reasons. Um, the DSM-5 TR, uh, it, it's been 10 years, okay? So um, think about in your area of specialization. I mean, if you're in Say you work in psychopharmacology, say you work in child forensics, say you work in addictions and substance, um, say you work in uh, IO, uh, say you work in health psych. Think about what's happened in those fields over the last 10 years. There's been a lot of change. So, in fact, change is happening more and more quickly, the accelerating pace of the generation of new knowledge. So if you're practicing on the basis of what you knew 10 years ago, uh, that's probably pretty outdated in most areas of practice. The overall half-life of knowledge in professional psychology right now is about seven years. And in some fields like forensics, uh, neuropsych, it's three to four years. So you're almost becoming uh, antiquated and obsolete before you graduate from a doctoral program. So uh, it's been a decade. That's a long time. But don't forget, the DSM has to articulate not only with changes driven by empirical uh, the generation of new knowledge, empirical developments within the field of psychology, psychiatry, and so forth. But it also has to articulate with social and cultural changes. Now think about it. A decade ago, we were early into the Me Too movement. There was no racial reckoning. There had been no COVID-19. All of that kind of socio-cultural evolution has occurred in the last 10 years. And so somehow the DSM-5, TR, has to articulate with the evolution of social consciousness. And the last decade has represented a quantum leap in social consciousness. If you take a single area, for example, like gender identity, and you look at where we were a decade ago versus where we are now, wow, big, big, big changes. So the DSM-5 has to remain au courant both in relation to what cha changes have occurred within the profession and within the broader culture that serves as the crucible within which the profession can operate. The other thing is that it needs to align with the ICD, and this is not an insignificant consideration because I've already alluded to the fact that while the DSM-5 was way back in 2013, uh, the ICD and uses and uh, used and uh, still uses the ICD-10 codes, there was an ICD-11 that came out in like 2017, 2018. So the DSM-5 has to keep up. It can't allow the ICD to come out with this new version uh, without at least paying attention to the changes that it's made and considering whether and which of its changes it can incorporate into the new DSM. So it's got to align with that or it becomes yesterday's bill quickly. So we'll talk about that.